Hi everyone, we are here at the National Institute of Business Management for a very interesting interview. Here with us in conversation today is Dr. Buddhima Hantini Subasingha. She's the youngest PhD holder here in South Asia as she obtained mm -hmm. her PhD at the age of 25 from the University of Peradeniya under the field of cyber security. In addition to this, she is also the head of department in the computer science field here at NIBM. Further to this, she has also had over 10 years of experience at the Sri Lanka Rupavahini Corporation. Hi ma'am, how are you doing today? Doing great, how are you doing? I'm doing quite well as well. So let's get started by yes. talking a bit about your childhood. How has it affected you and impacted you as you've come to this particular point in your life? Well, uh, if I take a look at my childhood, um, ever since I was a kid, a baby, uh, my, my parents, if I uh, talk about them, uh, both my parents were working. My mom right. used to work at Ministry of Higher Education and my dad uh, worked at Sri Lanka Customs. So they moved from Mathur to Colombo and uh, they had no place to leave me. So what they thought was as soon as possible to push me to a school. Right. So there I went to school when I was a three-year-old kid, right? right? Uh, so that's where my life began if I take a look back at exactly. my childhood. Now in Sri Lanka, a kid goes to school when they're six years exactly. old or five years old, but I started my journey when I was just a three-year-old kid. And I still remember carrying the milk bottle with me when I went to yeah. school. And I was that kid who used to trouble the uh, teacher and trouble the kids around, uh, waiting for mom to come and pick me up and so on and so forth. However, uh, and I, I, I also performed really well in mm -hmm. my uh, primary grades and, and I also got a double promotion. Now back in the days there was the situation where a kid gets double promotion when you performed really well in your academia, uh, probably uh, the first place in class for right. all the three terms and uh, then you, you have an average of more, more than 85% right. and then you're pushed to uh, the other class that's right. supposed to go to three, instead you go to five right. without four. So I got a similar double promotion when I was a smaller grade and that made me even more younger in class, exactly. in school. So that was in the primary grades. And, and that's where it all started. And it all started in the sense, I went through a lot of bullying when I was a kid in school. Like any other kid goes through bullying, but in my case, I went through a lot of bullying. Uh, why? Because I was smaller in exactly. size, yeah. younger in age, and people try to uh, knock you down, crush you down, and so on. Uh, but then I always ask this question from myself, Budima, if you are to stand up in life, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep crying and coming back home every day? Or are you going to create the worst situation in school? Uh, or are you really going to stand up for yourself? Exactly. So what I did was, I thought, fine, you've performed all this way and you've come all this way and do you want to stop here? And I thought to myself, no education is going to be the only weapon that's exactly. going to help me shape myself that's going to help me stand my ground and that's going to help me stand for myself exactly. could you say that that's an re a reason why you fast tracked yes. in your academic journey yes of course you're, you're very right uh, you know what I, that actually worked that right. actually worked and that helped me really uh, have the motivation the courage right. the determination to move forward right. because it worked uh, rather than getting myself entangled with a set of friends and to uh, party and have fun right. and, and, and just waste life probably right. in, in some instances like what happens to youth in exactly. schools. Instead I was focused on education. Right. Now then you might feel whether I was the person who was the bookworm only focused on the book <laughs> and only doing studies. Right. No. I also did netball. You will not believe or not. I also did ballet. I went wow, for ballet okay. competitions. I won right. and I've done candy and dancing and, and I've played chess into international scrabble and a lot more in terms of right. sports also. Okay. Uh, gradually, when I showed my performance, my colors in terms of education, I was able to convince teachers and, and, and show them, prove myself to them, to show that I am a person who can stand for myself right. and okay. I am someone in mm -hmm. the class. 13 was the age when I did my O-levels. 16 was the age when I did my A-levels and after finishing my O-levels again I, I had this question Budima what are you going to do next yeah. right yeah. Uh, for O-levels I took up uh, biochemistry physics human biology and whatnot all the so all the subjects that I could take up and then when it came to A-levels I, I had a question okay 
Is it going to be medicine? Is it going to be engineering? Or is it going to be ICT? And then, uh, then the, the next question was, okay, you go into an international school and are you able to go to uh, the National Medical College? No, you're not able to. You, you don't get the opportunity to get into it. Uh, so then I thought to myself, fine, why don't I take up bio, chemistry, physics, applied ICT and mathematics. Took up all five subjects and studied for my A-levels. And in the second year of A-levels, I dropped maths because it was very difficult to take yeah. up five subjects for A-levels. And, and I thought, okay, if I can't become a medical doctor in my life one day, I'm really going to keep a record in this country, in this small island definitely, to become uh, somebody in exactly. terms of a PhD, right? So that was the determination I had, that courage, that motivation. Every single day uh, when I wake up in the morning, I still remember uh, everything I need to take a note of. And I, I need to write down my plan for the day and I prioritize the task and that that's how I, I finish the task for the day and I look back to see whether I've done something to achieve my goal for today. Mm -hmm. And when I go back to sleep also, I take a look back to see whether I've done something today to achieve my goal. And then adding to it, 16 was when I finished my A-level, 17 was when I joined university and that's when I joined Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. Uh, to pursue my higher education in terms of uh, software engineering, uh, specializing in information technology. And, and then I also did another degree in computer science with the Curtin University of Australia in right. Western Perth. And, and then with my double degree, I got admission to University of Peradeniya to pursue my uh, PhD degree right. immediately after my undergraduate studies. Now, if if I take a look back, um, I finished my levels when I was 16, as I told you, 17 was when I joined university, and by 19 I was done with a double degree. Once again, I was the youngest undergraduate in right. Sri Lanka back, exactly. back in the days. And 19 was when I joined the academic staff of Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. I lectured for about two and a half years. Back then I was the youngest staff member yeah. there also. Life was challenging exactly. every single moment of my life. It was a challenge, right? right. Uh, every day I wake up and I uh, really think to myself, okay, what are you going to do for yourself today? What are you going to do for the organization? Yet every meeting I take part, every discussion, every person I meet to, to discuss on a certain thing, to agree upon and so on and so forth, it's a challenge. Why? Because I have to deal with people way elder to me exactly. and so on and so forth. Exactly. So, but I took it up. I mean, it really works uh, if you can really incorporate emotional intelligence to your life. I mean, okay. emotional intelligence, sometimes people think you need to read about it, you need to learn about it, and uh, you have to research about it. No, it's it's just how you need to really look into the emotions of other people okay. and right. balance your emotions, give a space for another's views, and how you respect another's views. I mean, and that's, that's how I exactly. see it. And it has really worked in my life. So if I could just um, ask a few questions just amidst yeah. that. Um, so you were actually talking about um, doing so many other extracurricular activities yeah. from ballet to playing chess and all of these sort of things. So e from back then and even right now, how could you say what, what was the key strategy which you used to kind of balance everything that you were doing? Well, yes. Now, I think the question comes time management. How exactly. do you how do you effectively time, manage time? Now, one thing I'd like to tell you is to anybody I speak to, I always tell this, you have 24 hours. I have 24 hours too in my life. Uh, but what really matters is how effectively do you manage exactly. this time? I have enough time for my family. I have enough time for my parents. I had and do have enough time for my studies. I mean, education is lifelong. And and even today at this very moment I am learning something exactly. uh, from whatever I do in life and and I think that openness to education is very important for you to really achieve yourself and succeed in life so managing time to focus right what I've realized in my life is I mean, I've been a child who had Dhamma school education from I was a five-year-old kid so somebody Bihar English Dhamma school ha has helped me shape myself to become a different person altogether I would I would really say that in, in whatever the stage I go to in whatever the place I stand I, I openly say that I am here as who I am today because of my Dhamma school 
because that education that I've got is priceless that has helped me shape myself to become a different individual altogether why why I say this is to answer your question focus right focus doesn't mean uh, just probably looking at a book and and just reading it and getting uh, that idea or whatever uh, or, or rather thinking about so many other things and uh, reading your your exactly. uh, study books or whatever textbooks or whatever no it's 100% focus on what you're doing and what you're doing only at that particular time. Being right. mindful at every single situation and being mindful of thoughts that arise in your mind. I've been practicing, I've been doing meditation ever since. And and then I even, even while doing meditation, I still remember there was a point I used to practice meditation under the guidance of a teacher. It was taught in the Dhamma school. And then I, there came a point where I thought to myself, look here, Budhima, why can't you apply this? Exactly. to whatever you're doing in life why can't you apply this to driving why can't you apply this when you're studying why can't you apply this when you're lecturing so I thought wow it can be applied yeah. right and I still remember uh, me first starting to drive and and I, I, I used to drive to instead of Peradeniya all by myself 3am right. in the morning waking up going there uh, like it was a challenge but I took up that challenge and each time the secret for my success has been focus. So this concept of meditation mm -hmm. how can the others also use it and apply it in their day-to-day -day life? I think I think uh, when it comes to Dhamma school education irrespective of which religion you are right you need to go through that education in right. life is what I would like to say because uh, yes we learn a portion of it in school yes we do learn a portion of it in the family that we live right. along with but now uh, the the world is fast moving and technology is evolving exactly. and students are so much engrossed in technology and we don't want to see uh, a generation of robots coming exactly. up right? right we want to see humans we want to see people with human touch we want to see people with values as the next generation taking over the world and the, and taking over the leadership of this nation and and also the world so if if that is the case then then we need to develop younger generation from the grassroots level with proper uh, emotions and values um, so just talking a bit about your corporate um, workspace right now so you've done so many things from being a presenter to being a, lect a visiting lecturer as well as being in a head of department so could you just tell me a bit about how you were able to pursue your passions and basically uh, put focus on one particular passion and then focus on the others as well i, I think uh, focus once again is very important like i told you multitasking is not uh, something that i would recommend to anybody uh, you you need to do something perfectly mm -hmm. and then move to the other task uh, from back in the days when i was a child uh, i used to go to dhamma school now once now one important thing i'd like to highlight is dhamma school education is something that kids or sometimes parents would take to be the least priority item of their child's education sometimes right, right. because I've I've been teaching in the Dhamma school for the past 14 years right. I've, I've been an Abhidhamma teacher and I'm still teaching and for the past 20 plus years I've been there in the Sri Sambodhi Vihara and I still go there and I tell my students, right, I've done my O-levels, I've done my A-levels, I've gone to university, I've done postgraduate studies, I've been overseas, but I've never given up on Dhamma school. Now, there are enough and more reasons for a child to give up on Dhamma school education, right? Because there are many other priorities in life. But if you can still stick together, if you can stick on to it, it can become a blessing to your life to help you move forward in life that's one thing so even today whatever the things I do Saturday morning my dear is something that I always look forward to be there I know about 30 to 35 kids are just waiting for me to not get anything but to learn human values from me so another thing is if I don't practice human values I can't go and teach Right? You can only preach what you practice right. and you can only practice what you preach. So it, it goes hand in hand right. and, and that is also a secret behind my success. Right. 
So answering to your question, yes, I, I joined the academic staff at Slate when I was 17 year old and um, immediately after my uh, degree um, at, uh, double degree at Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology and the Curtin University when I was just 20 years old, I joined the academic staff and immediately I started my PhD. So by 24 years, I was able to finish my PhD and also I'd like to tell you, uh, when I went to submit my PhD thesis, would you believe the university didn't accept it because there were six more months to submit it. Oh, wow. okay. So that was the kind of deadlines that I set for myself. Yeah. Now, in most cases, kids, youth, anybody, they are very good at procrastination. They are very good at putting things behind and not working on time. And if you are focused, if you are mindful about your targets, about your deadlines, I, I always, when it comes to a PhD, nobody's going to push you to say, look here, submit this uh, uh, progress, submit your progress report and submit this uh, presentation slide or submit this document. No, nobody's going to tell you. You can take eight years, you can finish in five years, or if you're really committed, you can finish in three and a half to four years right. so I kept all the deadlines for myself and I still remember taking the thesis and I didn't then realize oh I still have more time yeah. to submit this so that was the kind of motivation commitment dedication I had and and back in the days when I used to complete my PhD there was a time when I slept only two and a half hours sometimes I don't recommend any any kid to reduce the sleep sleeping time to two hours or two and a half hours but I'm telling you it's, it's always fine to sleep a good five hours, but if you can still manage your time, because I used to work, I used to study at the same time, but also I want to tell you, uh, when I uh, started teaching at Slate, it, I was 20 years old. After two and a half years, I gave up on my job. I quit. Right? Why? Because I wanted to continue my PhD from part time. I wanted to shift it to full time and keep the record. Because most of the professors were telling me, look here, Budima, you will definitely be able to keep a record if you convert it from part time to full time. And because you can still fast track it, you're fully full time engaged with your PhD then. Now, at that moment, I still remember uh, when I made that decision when I was at Slate, I made the decision next Monday, I'm going to give my resignation letter. Uh, and and then uh, when I went back home, my parents, I spoke to them and they were not for it, yeah. right? They were completely against it. Why? Because in Sri Lanka, you have this situation where a girl goes to school and then you finish your schooling and then you get into university, you have a good job and you're supposed to sustain, you're supposed to secure your job and then probably get married, have kids and whatnot. Now, this is the journey a kid has to go through in Sri Lanka. So typically, uh, any parent, any mom or dad would want you to follow the same. Mm -hmm. But I had a difficult time uh, convincing my dad and my mom uh, that I'm doing this for a cause and I'm, I'm doing this because I want to keep a record and, and I've proven them over the past years that I'm doing something in my life. So yes, finally, finally they were convinced. They were not happy about it, but yes, they were convinced right. because I was forcing them to be convinced. Exactly. But with that, uh, that decision, I, I always made a determination. I've, I've done something that nobody would do, giving up on your education, rather giving up on your job, mm -hmm. and then focusing only on education right. for quite some time in life when you are fully stabilized with a double degree. And what more, right? You can earn, you can lead a happy life. But um, yeah, so that was a tough decision. And there was least support from my family. And uh, once again, there comes a lot of bullying and then you meet parents, you meet, you meet friends, you meet relatives, you meet a lot of people around you and then they come and ask you, okay, uh, so what are you doing now? Oh, you don't have a job? Are you mm. staying at home? Oh, but you have, a, you have two degrees, right? Uh, so why? Yeah. Like, why do you want to stay at home? Uh, so when are you even getting married? Uh, do you know plans to get married? Right. So these are questions that people asked me and, and I thought to myself, look here, if you want to achieve yourself in life, if you have a target, if you have a goal, why worry about what other people say? Are you going to lead the lives of another or are you going to lead the life that you want to? So that was the question I right. asked, right? And, and I always had to convince my parents, look here, I don't want to lead the lives of the relatives, nor do I want to lead the lives of your friends. Right. I want to live the maximum life that I want right. to okay. live and okay. what I've been dreaming for. 
and and yes, uh, yeah. when I finished my PhD, when I graduated, when I kept the record really, and when I and then I started uh, giving keynote addresses in and out of Colombo and then suburbs and also out of the country. I've visited many Asian countries, and I and I got a lot of recognition, right. respect for what I have achieved. And then I, I still remember looking at my dad's face to ask him, Dad, I hope I made you proud. Yeah. And Mom, I hope I made you proud. So yes, they are very proud about where I stand now. Okay. Sometimes, my dear, in life, you have to really uh, leave certain things off. Rather, there's an opportunity cost for you. Uh, but that opportunity cost is uh, with the determination that you have and the motivation, the courage that you have to achieve yourself in life. Now, I gave up on my job at that moment. That was a turning point in my life. If I didn't work for myself, what's going to happen? I would just end up being in exactly. the house right. even today. But I worked hard and I went for my goal. Right, Every day and night, I just had one dream mm -hmm. and that dream only to achieve myself, to keep a record, that's it. Right. So I was moving forward with it and I achieved it. So I think uh, just like any trainer would do, uh, if you want to become a champion in something, you need to go through a lot of training, right. day and night of training, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. And that helped me develop my focus to a level where even at my office, getting back to whatever the office things yeah. that I do, uh, it helps me focus on something and complete a target very easily right. um, and also uh, emotional intelligence has helped me really drive myself forward every day is a challenge being the youngest staff member here as well exactly. uh, once again it's uh, it's not easy mm -hmm. but uh, emotional intelligence once right. again has helped me work with the people who are okay. there to me right. still they respect your views and help helps you also to drive your okay. goals right. and the company's goals yeah the organization so, goals to achieve so. right so just um, coming back to the previous question which I asked just want to check um, so how have you been able to balance all the three passions which you had in presenting uh, from being a head of department individual as well as being a visiting yes. lecturer yes that's that's because uh, Rupa Wahini Presenting has always been my hobby. Right. Uh, Sri Sambodhi Vihara is the place, the Buddhist channel is the place where I first stepped into presenting. Yeah. Uh, I was brought up in the dumb school and I, I learned a lot of things uh, in that background. And then they, they saw that I do have a talent in presenting and I was given, I was offered an opportunity to become the first English uh, English bulletin, uh, mm -hmm. Buddhist uh, news bulletin, producer and presenter of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So back in the days when the Buddhist channel first started, right. I produced and presented the first English news, Buddhist news bulletin mm -hmm. for Sri Lanka. So that gave me uh, a, a big space for me and to And how really, old were you? I was then? only 16 back right. then. I, okay. was very, I was only 16 when I first started presenting at uh, the Buddhist channel. It was by accident. Mm -hmm. Actually right. what happened was um, uh, on, on that particular day, there was no girl presenter to do news. And, and the program director, Mr. Shashika Jayatilaka, he walked up to me and then he asked, uh, Buddhi Malangi, will you be able to take the Singhala news today? I said, I, I always love to do news, right? Either Rupa Wahini or anywhere else if I got the opportunity. So I was very passionate about it. And when he told me that, I thought, oh, wow, I'm really going yeah. to grab this. I grabbed the opportunity, right. but then when I went up to the newsroom, I was given the script and I thought, oh my God, Sinhalese, I've not studied in Sinhala, neither have I uh, learned Sinhala to that level. And it was a Sinhalese script. But with courage, I, I still remember running to the washroom practicing the script more than 100 times. Mm -hmm. I read it over and over again to make myself familiarized with it. And I did the bulletin that right. day all by myself. And then he understood my skills, my abilities, my talents. And uh, he told me, uh, you're really good at this. I'm giving you about two or three more opportunities to take it up. Would you like to do so? So he added me to the news team. And then I did about five uh, news bulletins afterwards. And then he walked up to me to say, Naik Hamdra wants you to start an English news bulletin in the first time in Sri Lanka. Would you like to take it up? Buddhist news. So I produced mm -hmm. and presented and did it for about five years. 
and uh, then I also did another program called Beyond the Vision which was uh, very popular among Sri Lankans and also overseas uh, people where people used to really comment on it because it was a program where I, um, I, I designed it. Beyond the Vision is a, a vision beyond what you see, right. looking at things in a different perspective and seeing things as they are. Right. So it was actually Abhidhamma teaching it in a very subtle manner where any person from any religion can understand mm -hmm. so it was more focused on humanity and human values and how we need to really be good people to serve better in the society so we look at a better life mm -hmm. right so uh, that program also continued for about five six years and then in the meantime was when i was interviewed by rupa wahini corporation i joined them and it's closer to 10 years i'm right. with rupa wahini now and i'm doing buddhist programs and uh, rise and shine business right. today programs like that and i'm finding it very interesting because with the schedule that i'm going through exactly. It helps me. It's my hobby. It's my passion. Right. It helps me take a time off and to meet a lot of people mm -hmm. right. and be with people and so on. Okay. But you see, when I'm focused, within a shorter period of time, I can complete a task. I have that ability, right? That's with focus. So that helps me do many different other things in right. life also. So putting time to dumb school, putting time to presenting, putting time off to mentor a child, uh, putting time off for Toastmasters. I've been with the district team and 2017-18 uh, uh, was when I was the Toastmasters International Training and Leadership Institute Chair for Sri Lanka, right. District 82. That was a big role. Right. And I think I learned a lot of leadership uh, you know, skills and qualities from that. Uh, so putting time off for Toastmasters, all that, uh, it's, it's all about focus. You're asked something within a shorter time period, you focus, you do it to finish it, you can do another right. task. Okay. And I just don't waste time mm -hmm. also in my right. life. Okay. Uh, so, so, yeah. Yes. So let's talk about your experience in the information technology field. Yes. How did you start and why did you select this particular field? Yes. Uh, now speaking of my PhD in risk management, cybercrime investigation and conflict resolution, I thought this is the future of uh, the world. And and when I had to, now my, my undergraduate studies, my, my undergraduate thesis was based on a different uh, field. It was mm -hmm. on image processing and right. it was different. It was more into software engineering. And then, and then I thought, okay, fine. PhD, uh, my my further higher education. Am I going to select something that helps me be in my comfort zone, or am I going to select something that helps me explore the world, right. discover more, and be updated on what's happening and and move forward right. uh, with the technological advancements? So with that, in risk management, and 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 then it became a very interesting field because this is the future of the world. Now, once again, on the other hand, giving a little bit of advice to parents right uh, sometimes parents think in Sri Lanka think that uh, kids should not be with the mobile phone should not be with technology uh, because it spoils them no social media uh, is not to be blocked we shouldn't block uh, social media or we shouldn't block certain uh, pathways uh, for kids to really learn something and and develop themselves we shouldn't right because it, it can be, yes, it can be used as a weapon and at the same time it can be used for the right thing. So I think the awareness needs to go out for the parents that irrespective of whichever the field, I loved medicine, right? right? I, I learned it but I couldn't become a medical doctor but I excelled myself to become a PhD holder. Uh, so at the same time, in, you need to understand that any field, irrespective of what field you're taking up, information technology is something that would be going hand in hand be it medicine, be it engineering, or be it humanities, be it law and order, you will still exactly. need information right. communication technology. So yes, I didn't do it once again. Uh, helping your child to be uh, literate in ICT, irrespective of which field the child would want to go to, is very, very important. Yes. Right, and so when we talk about your efforts on a national as well as an international level in the IT field, um, could you tell me a bit about the importance as well as the advantages of being an IT literate woman? Yes, being an IT literate woman or rather being a smart woman right. I think is very important mm -hmm. for you to sustain yourself in life. We speak a lot, like I mentioned earlier as well, about sustainable development goals right. and how important uh, an empowered woman's life should exactly. be. 
right i would i would say if you are a smarter woman if you want to be a smart woman uh, you need to really uh, use technology embrace technology not be that woman uh, who is um, uh, you know having this uh, stereotypic mindset that uh, a man should do it uh, a man should take the front seat and I should take the back seat and and have that stereotypic mindset that I need to always take the second place uh, or rather I need to take the back seat in everything. No, in my life, gender stereotyping was something that I never considered, mm -hmm. right? I always thought if somebody called a man who is a human can do it, I can do it. Exactly. Why not? Exactly. Right. And and at the same time, you need to also uh, have that motivation in mind. We are all humans and you still can achieve yourself in life if you really have the courage and the determination right. to do so. Um, and on the other hand, when, when speaking of women's empowerment, we, we have this stereotypic mindset uh, that uh, we can't do certain things. Right. Uh, STEM is not for us sometimes, science, engineering, technology, exactly. mathematics is not for us or rather arts and uh, crafts are for women. Certain countries still do have that kind of mindset and certain people even in Sri Lanka do have and that is why so, um, a larger population of girls even get into arts, uh, arts stream and so on and so forth. But I think um, once again awareness has to be given to the parents. If a child loves technology, if a child loves science, you need to give that girl the opportunity to move exactly. forward yeah. uh, and and a parent should never uh, put an obstacle in between to say or rather have their dreams achieved through their children a, a parent should always help the child achieve him or his or her dreams right. and help them to do what they love and help them to love what they do. And right. that's when we can help them achieve success. Right. Uh, rather, if the parent is going to push the child to do what they want to do, it's very difficult for us to see uh, um, an educated child uh, getting into the society. Right, okay. Yeah. And so talking a bit more about that, <coughs> how do you think you could encourage other young women mm -hmm. to uh, pursue their careers in other diversified fields. Yes, uh, once again, as, as I also mentioned, uh, it's one thing uh, we have to take off this stereotypic mindset, exactly. right? Uh, completely remove it. Uh, the thinking that we have that men can do things and women can't do things, right? Uh, women are also humans after all, and women also can uh, achieve themselves in life just as much as men can exactly. and and women also do complain to say we are not given this seat we are not given this opportunity but what really happens is women don't grab the opportunities exactly. I don't complain men for what's happening to women because never in my life openly honestly I would say that ever a man has not uh, given an opportunity for me to achieve myself in life or a man has become an obstacle in my life never in my life it has right. happened but women do complain a lot about men why do we keep complaining is my question you need to grab the opportunity see men uh, they even give opportunities but we don't grab it that's right. that's the point yeah. there because sometimes there are enough and more job opportunities but do women apply that's, that's the question there. So you need to apply for those job opportunities, go for it, face it properly, grab it, get it, make it yours and make most out of it. That's what really matters. And on the other hand, also in my life, age stereotyping was something that I had in mind. I, sometimes I used to think now at a very younger age when I achieved myself and I keep on achieving and then I need to report to senior levels and so on. Uh, I, I've, I've sometimes thought, Putima, can you do this? You're, you're small, can you handle it? You're, you're in, in, a, in a very younger age. And, and especially people like the chairman of NIBM, I need to tell you. Um, first board meeting that I reported and I presented, after the board meeting he called me back to the office room and then he was talking to me and he was asking, um, he, he told me that you've done great. I said, sir, I was very scared. This is my first uh, board presentation and uh, uh, I was 
even thinking how uh, old were you uh, when uh, about uh, one year back this okay. was right. yeah but reporting to the board is and doing a presentation right. uh, it's 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 a it's quite it's quite at a exactly. level because yeah. you need to convince you have to convince senior most management yeah on what you're trying to say uh, and then he told me, Putima, don't worry, you've come all this way. Age is just and just a number. So all, all you need to do is uh, keep moving, keep exactly. moving. Education is lifelong and you have the potential. You have the potential and keep moving because education is lifelong and you can, can always uh, achieve yourself to even reach greater heights and okay. I'm sure you can do it. So when people like that uh, motivate you, uh, help you and support you also with that positive mindset mm -hmm. it helps you move forward now right. on the other hand uh, role models of life sometimes when, when when students come and ask me to mentor them coach them and so on one thing I ask them do you have a role model in life I think a role model in life is very important why because each moment in our life we go through hardships, we go through battles, we go through the most difficult ever moments exactly. and we go through the happiest ever moments and we go through uh, the moments where we feel like life is a bed of roses as well. It, you know, life is like a piano. You have the black keys that represent the saddest, the most difficult moments of life and you have the white keys that represents the most happiest moments of life. The combination of uh, the melody of the black and white keys create the most harmonious music after all. Uh, so, all right. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of both. So, in my life, Professor Stephen Hawking uh, has been my mentor, or rather mm -hmm. my role model in life. So, I've always looked up to him to say, if Hawking could do this, why can't I? Okay. It was a question that I always asked. Right. So you need to have a role model exactly. in life okay. to really push yourself forward. Right. Exactly. So that sounds very interesting. Um, so one final question. So you've broken so many glass ceilings right now. What plans do you have for the future? Well, yes, I'm, I'm currently heading the Department of Computer Science at the National Institute of Business Management and a lot of rep responsibilities, a lot of things to be looked at, the development of the School of right. Computing and so on and so forth. And uh, looking forward to uh, work on my professorship very soon. And I'm working on a lot of international publications as well and I've been doing it and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am moving forward in my academic career and looking forward to become okay. a pro professor very soon right. yes okay. right so there you have it guys um that was our interview with dr buddhi mahantani sabasingha so i'm pretty sure every one of you viewers um obviously gained some sort of message out of this i'm sure i did so thank you very much for being here with us and i wish you all the very best in all your future endeavors thank you so much thank for you. interviewing me as well and it was a great interview and i wish you a pleasant day as well thank all the best so to you much. Hey guys, thanks for watching. To keep up with the pulse of Sri Lanka, subscribe to our channel here. To watch our latest videos, click here and here. Keep living it.